everyone. My name is Ngan Wu, and I'm a research engineer at DeepMind. Today, I'll also be your host for our discussion on AI in Vietnam. Being born and raised in Hanoi, I have always been looking for ways to make the field of AI more inclusive of Vietnam and Southeast Asia, which I think are underrepresented communities that are also emerging markets for the field. I'm very glad that Jeff Dean, our main guest speaker for today, would also like to support these communities. And one of the first steps is by joining in these important conversations. Jeff Dean joined Google in 1999 and is currently a Google Senior Fellow leading Google AI and related research efforts. We're both calling in today from California, the United States, and from the other side of the globe in Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, we will also be joined by Hung Bui, the Director of AI Research, for more insights into the landscape of AI in Vietnam. You can find more information about Jeff and Hung in the description box below. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jeff and Hung to our conversation. Thank you both. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, before we are uh, start talking, I just want to say that we have about at least 800 people watching us right now. Uh, and it looks from my polls that we have people listening from all continents, including Antarctica for some reason. Uh, so yeah, I know that Jeff, you, you want to play, I think one of your life goals is to play basketball and soccer on every single continent, right? Um, and now you have people listening to you from every single continent. So that checkbox is at least done. Um, I want to start with a warm up question for Jeff. Uh, what's your personal experience with the country, the people and culture of Vietnam? Sure. So, um, I mean, I think I've never actually traveled to Vietnam. It's always been on my list of uh, places that I really want to go visit. Uh, so I will get there someday. Um, I love Vietnamese food. My my favorite restaurant in Palo Alto is uh, a Vietnamese restaurant that is uh, sort of really yummy food. Um, and then I have a number of colleagues who are originally from Vietnam, but work in California with me. Uh, and I've been co-authors on many papers with, you know, really great Vietnamese researchers like Quoc Lee and Thang Luong and other people like that. And, uh, you know, I think um, one of the things I really appreciate in my job is that I get to work with people from so many different places in the world and we each kind of share little stories or anecdotes about like something that we experienced growing up or what things are like in, in my country or your country and it's, it's really a, a great way to get to know people and get to experience um you know other cultures and i really relish that yes that's amazing to hear and we really hope that we can welcome you in person in vietnam one day uh, I will talk to count, but the COVID uh, situation. <laughs> this is going to pass soon, hopefully. Um, and then a little bit more serious. What's your experience with AI and uh, technology in Vietnam? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the uh, Viet Vietnamese ha tend to have a very strong background in math and science. I think you have a, a very good sort of primary and secondary education system that really prepares people well for you know, doing data science and machine learning and AI research. Um, and so that's why I've, you know, in my own uh, job in California, encountered a number of Vietnamese who have, have uh, made that their career. Um, I think within Google, we have a number of, of products that are uh, worldwide and are used by people all over the world and are very important for you know, different countries to sort of, for example, uh, Google Translate is a good example where, you know, the ability of AI and machine learning to improve that product over the last five years has really made things like the ability to translate from Vietnamese to English or to other languages um, dramatically better. And I think that's, that's a really great property because it brings the world closer together. If we can all sort of understand documents or what everyone is saying, mm -hmm. that will just make uh, communication in the world better. Yes, I totally agree with you. And then for the next question is actually for Hung. Uh, I know that you had experience working in the US before and specifically at DeepMind in Google's Mountain View campus. So actually very close to Jeff. 
And after leaving DeepMind, you have been leading uh, AI Research Institute in Vietnam for about two years now. So could you perhaps uh, describe the AI scene in Vietnam and, and compare it to your experience in Silicon Valley so that Jeff and everyone in the, in the audience can have a better context? Well, well thank you. That's, uh, that's a great question. Um, actually, I've only been back to Vietnam for like a year and a half, so not two years yet. I haven't <laughs> reached that mark yet. Um, but yeah, um, uh, I think the thing that uh, really impressed me the most is the, just you know how talented uh, young people are um, in Vietnam. Um, I think they are obviously very inexperienced, right? But um, it seems to me that um, um, there's kind of like a gap between uh, what their career uh, should be, should be looking like, uh, should be should look like versus you know basically the, the kind of potentials that they actually have. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, with the creation of uh, VinAI, which is uh, I, I think is the first. Um, um, AI lab in Vietnam with a focus on fundamental research. Uh, we try to fix that problem. Um, so I believe that um, you know you, you can't really give a good education, good good AI education without you know subjecting um, the young talents to um, the really um, high quality research, right? And um, and here you know for example we are running an AI residency program. Um, we try to attract uh, really the best talents from local universities. Of course, you know, the AI residency program but was a great model invented at Google Brain. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, um, we, we are able to, um, you know, work with um, the really raw talents. They, they're, they're not experienced, but uh, I was amazed by how fast they can actually catch up to um, you know, concepts in, you know, deep learning, uh, machine learning, uh, fundamental statistics and so on. Um, so, so yeah, so I think um, that, uh, that, that was something that um, I was uh, really positive about. That was something that very positive about my experience. Yeah. Um, now, the people in Vietnam, uh, they also tend to work very hard. Um, so I thought that, you know, people in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, um, we were working very hard in Silicon Valley, but, you know, when I got back to Vietnam, you know, <laughs> it's actually surprised that people here, you know, sometimes actually work even harder than Silicon Valley. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, I think it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a country of 100 million people. Uh, there are just, you know, so many uh, young and raw talents out there. So I think that's, um, uh, that, that's I think that's, that's uh, something that's really positive about my experience. Um, now the difference, obviously, you know, it's it's also there's day and night difference between <laughs> uh, Silicon Valley and Vietnam. Um, and Vietnam is still a developing country, um, so there, there there are a lot of problems. You know, when, when, whenever you go, you know, the problems with you know. Um, so we're talking about we were you know joking about you know, air quality uh, before the call, but you know, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, environmental problem is is one of the issue, uh, one of the big issue in Vietnam, air quality. Uh, everyday air quality, right? Uh, also traffic. Um, I mean, you, you kind of like, you never see the, the road conditions in Vietnam, you know, um, anywhere in, in the US, right? So I don't know, like you want to build a autonomous vehicle. Uh, well, I would say that the ultimate test is just try to see whether your vehicle can actually drive on the streets of Hanoi. Uh, um, yeah, and, and yeah, and so, you know, I think, um, very different uh, perspective in terms of um, how the economy works, but I think Vietnam is uh, young and it's uh, it's been going very fast. So, uh, so I can see there's a lot of potential in the development of the country. Amazing. Uh, yes, I agree with you. There's a lot of potentials for Vietnam, and thank you so much for for creating or or leading this lab so that you can make the most use of those potentials. Uh, but as we discussed before, there's a lot of uh, of uh, challenges for Vietnam uh, and the major thing that come to my mind is in terms of resources. So we know that uh, the development of AI actually requires a lot of resources, both in terms of labor, in, in terms of AI talents and capital, right? So that's computing power or infrastructure to store data. So companies like Google and countries like the US have the best of both worlds. Right? They have the best of both of these. Um, while companies in small countries like Vietnam uh, it's a lot harder for them to to compete with uh, limited infrastructure and also suffering from brain drain um, and is at risk of being left behind. 
So I would like to ask, what should each of us do in our unique position to stop the gap between the developed and the developing worlds from growing even larger due to AI? And I want to really highlight our different positions here. Jeff, you are the leader of an AI first multinational technology company. Uh, and whom you are a leader of the PN Vietnam with experience abroad, and I would just be uh, uh, representing the Vietnamese youth at home and abroad. Who would you like to start? Jeff, do you want to start first? <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, AI has this tremendous potential to really impact people all over the world, both in its use and application, but also in the set of people who are making contributions to that. And I think we've uh, as a company at Google, one of the things that we really value is how can we take technologies like AI and machine learning and democratize it so that more and more people around the world can participate in you know, improving and using these approaches in pushing the research forward. Um, as one good example, uh, you know, about five years ago, we decided we would open source the sort of internal software libraries we were using to develop all of our machine learning algorithms uh, as a system called TensorFlow. And TensorFlow in the five, last five years has become the, the number one most popular machine learning open source library in the world. It's been downloaded like 130 million times. You know, people in many, many organizations, many countries all over the world are making use of it to, um, you know, both learn about machine learning and AI to make fundamental research advances but also to tackle problems in their own local environment, in their communities. Mm -hmm. The things that they see as, you know, maybe a particular problem in Vietnam that maybe people outside of Vietnam don't necessarily see as a problem, but the local Vietnamese feel is something that we should really be tackling with machine learning. I think the beauty of TensorFlow and open source software and the fact that also computational devices have become relatively inexpensive for at least the level of, of uh, you know, computation you need to solve a lot of real world problems really has helped in making it so people all over Vietnam, Southeast Asia, Africa, uh, other parts of the world can solve problems and also can use the same tools that we're using at Google and in the US to solve these problems. I think that's what we really should do and we also really strongly believe in publishing nearly all of our research. So we're very open. We publish, you know, eight or 900 papers per year that really are pushing the state of the art uh, in machine learning and AI forward. And we want the entire community to learn from what we've been able to, to tackle. And we also benefit in return by having the rest of the community publish the work that they're doing. So I think this is a global community making advances on some of the most important and fundamental problems that we have today. And then Hung, what do you think? Well, I think a lot of uh, many things that Jeff said uh, really spot on. Um, uh, but I want to go back to um, the importance of uh, education. Because um, I, I think uh, education um, is a really important uh, way to um, narrow the gap between, you know, like a developing country in, like Vietnam uh, versus the first world. Um, and uh, you know, since I've got back, I thought quite a bit about um, um, why is it that you know the the, the young talents in Vietnam um, they why is it difficult for them to receive you know if not the same level of education in the U.S. you know something that's um, it's almost the same, right? Um, and, and and yeah, I think uh, there are many problems with um, you know, I'd say with the local universe systems and things like that. And, and we can just you know use them as excuse to not doing anything. Um, but uh, I, I think there are things that can be done. Um, so for example, uh, you know, at uh, VinAI, we are thinking about how we can actually you know uh, make. Um, the things that we use to teach our residents, uh, just you know, freely open to everybody in Vietnam, for example. Um, so we're thinking about you know, like something like a, an open foundation for AI education uh, in Vietnam. Um, and uh, I think simple things like how to teach them, you know, linear algebra, how to teach them basic machine learning. 
how to teach them the basic of deep learning, I think that's going to go a really long way because there's so many people are interested in the technology. There's so many people, so many young, talented people are eager to learn. Um, but uh, it seems that there's something, something actually missing in order to, to help them um, ne- reach the next level. Um, and, and, and then, uh, actually, I'm, uh, what, what I found is that, you know, I think research is, is also actually important. Um, somehow, like, if I think the developing world don't pay enough, you know, attention to research, then, then the gap is just going to get, you know, wider and wider. Um, now, we probably don't need to, you know, invest, you know, a huge amount in uh, fundamental research in countries like Vietnam, but, you know, the, at least has to be something, right? Um, as, as be people can actually show other people, okay, this is the way of, you know, um, how, feel, how the field of AI is, 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 um, is advancing and, um, you know, this is a way of people to, to catch up. Um, yeah, but uh, in terms of uh, narrow the gap, um, I think Jeff also mentioned about uh, problems that are unique um, uh, for the developing countries like Vietnam. So I think he, he uh, I believe he mentioned something like you know translation between the um, English and Vietnamese, and, and obviously that's something that uh, uh, people in Vietnam uh, care a great deal about. Um, uh, and and yeah. Then there are many other problems, uh, local problems, right? Uh, we can actually use to motivate uh, people here. Um, uh, and and but but I think I, I also do hope that you know um, I think big tech companies could uh, perhaps have to play a greater role in you know improving the standard of AI education uh, universally. Okay, I agree with you. Um, Thank you both for your answers and for all the all the impacts that you made uh, for for the field to push the field forward, not just in the U.S. but worldwide. Uh, and for me personally, I'm I'm just starting my career, and I would not be able to make huge impacts like you two do. But I would also like to encourage people of my age who are just starting to to be aware of these problems and to just look into it. Uh, even though you're just starting to know what what you're capable of doing, um, and and then just like do the best to 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 contribute. So like for example, for me, I would not be able to make huge huge impact, but I'm in a lucky position where I can connect you two together and we can have this conversation, right? Um, so that's like the small stuff that I'm doing to to help contribute a little bit to to this problem, to solving this problem. Okay, and it happens to be the case that the majority of the most voted questions uh, from our audience are all about kind of how do we support the development of AI in Vietnam and other emerging markets. So I'd like to invite the authors of these questions to deliver uh, these questions to Jeff themselves. Uh, We don't have a live audience, but this is the closest that we can bring an audience together. Uh, So yeah, for the first top voted question. Uh, could you please briefly introduce yourself and then ask your question to Jeff? Um, hi, thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Tang and I'm currently a uh, software engineer. A huge fan of both of you, Jeff and Hung. Uh, so my question is that what should and shouldn't be the approach to build a stable and impactful tech industry in country with limited experience and infrastructure like Vietnam? Uh, especially as you guys mentioned before, Uh, in terms of education, since Vietnamese students generally have a very good background in math and nature science, but then language is sometimes a huge barrier. Mm. Thank you for your question. And I just also want to mention that there's also another uh, voted question with a lot of upvotes that uh, on education in Vietnam. Um, I I, I think, uh, as you say, uh, having a really strong background in basic math and science education is uh, something that that Vietnam has a great educational system for. And I think that really sets people up well for studying or sort of having uh, careers in AI and machine learning. Um, It's really uh, great that there's going to be opportunities available for people who, who do have this kind of strong math and science background. Um, so I think, I do think, you know, the language barrier sometimes can be an issue because most research papers are written in English. I think people, and you know, if they are interested in, in sort of doing 
cutting edge research or following the research uh, um, sort of literature in some subfield. Generally, we well served by having a good command of, of especially written English. Um, I think uh, the the approach of you know working on education at all different levels, you know, secondary education, uh, uh, college uh, level education, and then making sure that people have opportunities to go do advanced graduate study, uh, be it in Vietnamese the universities or going abroad and then coming back to Vietnam is really going to be a key way in which a already fairly thriving uh, ecosystem of AI and machine learning researchers who uh, grew up in Vietnam will continue to grow and flourish. Um, I think you know many countries are sort of seeing similar uh, approaches and they believe that having strong education and then having uh, local talent work on the most advanced problems is the way to, to go. I, I kind of agree with, with Hung that uh, having some set of people doing fundamental research uh, is going to be really important in building a, a good, strong research ecosystem. That's the kind of thing that will bring people who maybe have gone abroad to study back to, to Vietnam to also continue their careers there. I think a lot of countries are seeing that, um, where now more and more people are returning to their, their country of origin after studying abroad for a while. Um, so I think you know that's certainly good. And then uh, you know just exposing people to this as a potential career and, and letting people know that this is something where you can have a lot of impact. I think one of the great things about AI and machine learning is it's not just a computer science field, right? It's something that is going to fundamentally change and is fundamentally changing many, many fields of endeavor. So things like education and healthcare and, you know, uh, robotics and, uh, you know, uh, climate science, uh, basic science. Uh, are all being affected by the advances being made in machine learning. And I think that a really neat thing about this is that people who are interested in some of those other topics can pick up and learn about AI and machine learning and then apply it to some of these other areas. And some of the most interesting advances I think will be made at the intersection of, you know, fundamental problems in, in medical science and machine learning or uh, the ability to apply machine learning to educational tools like that. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, do you have like any? Uh, yeah, so uh, you mentioned the language barrier and uh, something that uh, we are hoping to, to be able to help uh, here at VinAI as well. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, which is, you know, we this is just still at a brainstorming stage, but uh, when we talk to a group of, you know, research scientists and also residents in, in our lab, and, um, you know, we just, you know, said, okay, you know, like, you know, what if we just localize, you know, uh, a lot of the uh, great uh, teaching materials that's already there, right, uh, in many, you know, excellent open course. And, and by, you know, localization, you know, well, uh, perhaps, you know, very good subtitle, uh, subtitle for uh, the video lectures, uh, or even having someone to actually teach the same materials in Vietnamese. Right? Um, um, I, I think uh, maybe perhaps the slides, you know, and the reading materials, uh, probably uh, English is probably fine uh, because I think people uh, can, uh, to some extent, uh, read English better than they can listen, right? Um, but, but yeah, um, I mean, things like, you know, having people to, you know, teach the same materials in Vietnamese. Um, uh, now, um, you're going to have to, you know, in order to have to run a proper online courses, you're going to have to have, you know, uh, tutors and, you know, people who can actually, you know, uh, help the students along and that communications can also be in Vietnamese, right? So I think a lot of that would go a long way. Um, and, and and of course, and now that now that now that you know we, we, we thought that far, now we ending up with a problem. So how are we going to scale this, right? So, um, um, so we're thinking about perhaps adopting some system like you know Coursera or edX, but you know, um, um, uh, try to localize it for Vietnamese market. And I think everybody, you know, what I mean is every other developing countries can perhaps uh, try to do the same, 
Um, and it, there's no shortage of really great material these days on the web. Um, but the organization of, of how to make it you know, more widely available um, for um, your different countries, I think that's still a problem. Uh, thank you for the answer. Oh, thank you for the answers. It's really detailed. Uh, thanks for having me today. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Uh, great. Goodbye. Um, and can we have the, the next question, please? Would you like to introduce yourself and ask your question? Uh, hello, Jeff. Hello, Hung. Uh, my name is Fong. I am a vis visiting researcher in Mila, uh, based in Montreal, Canada. Uh, and I also running a, a small AI lab in Hanoi, Vietnam. Um, so my question today is I would like to ask for your advice on um, what do you think would be a good ratio for fundamental and applied research in Vietnam? The reason I ask this question is because there's many companies in Vietnam cannot afford to have a, a fundamental research like Google or VinAI. Can you? Sure. I mean, I can I can jump in. I'm sure Hung will have thoughts as well. I mean, I think any sort of research endeavor that you're that you're operating generally has this problem of what should the mix of research be uh, in terms of things that are maybe a little bit near term, a little more, uh, you know, are more likely to pay off. Uh, you know, you're you're reasonably sure this will work out in a year or two or whatever. Uh, versus something that is you know, more fundamental and might take three or four or five or ten years to sort of really pay off. There's no certainty there. Um, and I think you kind of want to manage the set of things that are being worked on in a, in a small research lab or a large research organization as a portfolio. So you kind of can view them as investments into things that you think have some probability of paying off and that uh, are, if they succeed, will have some reasonable set of outcomes. Now, obviously, because of research, many of these things you can't predict very well. And so that's part of the, the beauty of trying to figure out what are the things you should be working on, either individually or as a small group or as a, a larger organization. Um, but I think having some fundamental research that you think is both you know, difficult and challenging and will really advance the, the field in some way you know, I think you should never be working on things where if the best possible outcome happens, there's really no real practical impact. It's sort of like, eh, okay, great. I think you really want to be tackling problems that are fundamentally important and that are going to make a big leap forward if you're able to make progress on the problem. And so that, I think, is a good lens by which to think about how do you want to work on problems in your career? Maybe you're an early, you're not, but like an early stage student should be thinking about problems that they're excited about, that they think are important in the world, and that will then, you know, have the ability to to make improvements in, in whatever topic that, that you uh, undertake. Now that, that's kind of how I view it. It's not one answer or the other. It's a mix of things and some of the fundamental investments or fundamental research will take longer to pay off and may have less probability of success, but if it does pay off, it will be important. And so that's kind of what you're balancing in where we think are a little bit shorter term and more likely and more applied. Great. Thank you, Fong, for joining uh, us today. Uh, do you have any comments that you want to add on? Uh, I, I think uh, Jeff had some really great idea. Um, and I, I would uh, I would say that uh, that ratio probably shouldn't be zero, right? Um, and and then I, I was also add that uh, over time that ratio tends to get smaller mm -hmm. if you're funded by a you know private company because there's always pressure more pressure uh, for you to make shorter and shorter impact. So it's something that uh, you want to watch out for. And then, and then uh, the moment when you have to run both the research group and also the apply and uh, commercialization group, which is you know what I'm doing here at VinAI, then you know 
I mean, you can see immediately there's a tendency for the two groups to drift apart. And, and if they do drift apart, then, then that's bad because that's not the best way to make use of the resource that you are given, right? Um, so one of the things, you know, as uh, 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 someone you can actually oversee both two groups is, is, is to see opportunities very early on for uh, the research group to make impact uh, on the applied side, so that you know, the applied side can actually appreciate. Okay, you know these guys they don't just you know um, uh, sit there and writing papers all day. Um, and, uh, and 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 you know like uh, I, th I think the having the visibility on the product side and be able to identify problems. Oh, you know like you know that problem. You give it, give it to the research side. They will you know save you a great amount of pain and you know time and. And, um, and, and yeah, so, you know, at VAI, we are able to, you know, do some of that um, early work. And then, you know, the two groups are uh, usually gel together quite well. Well, until now, right? <laughs> Still very early on in the game. But yeah. Yeah, I will say one more thing about this, which is, uh, you know, sometimes fundamental research leads to big advances that then have lots of different potential applications. Uh, but sometimes, in working in a slightly more applied problem, uh, you end up identifying something that is a fundamental research problem that is going to be important. And so it's really a two-way street where feedback about the fundamental research kind of improves lots of things. And then some of the recognitions of things we can't yet do, but that would be important to improve an applied setting actually can lead to fundamental research sort of roadmaps and agendas. Thank you, uh, Jeff and Hung, for your answers. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, and then could we have the next question on, please? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zhang. Uh, I'm currently a data analyst at PostClick in San Francisco. And I'm also a co-host at podcast Home Jump Come with Nong. Um, so today I have a question for our panel is that uh, what is your vision of AI in emerging markets like Vietnam? And uh, what are the meaningful problems that we can harness the power of AI to solve? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I guess I'll go first. I, I, but I, I feel like there's so much potential for, for AI in so many different problems in the world, especially ones that are sort of uh, really ones that affect uh, more developing um, markets in countries like, like Vietnam. I think the, the potential of using AI to make much better healthcare decisions for everyone and often having you know, a really uh, well-developed healthcare system is something that, that uh, many countries are sort of still working on. And I think AI and machine learning can actually make tremendous advances where you can take sort of expert opinions where most people would not get access to those experts and train machine learning models to replicate the, the effectiveness of an expert in many, many different areas of medicine and then have those decision-making uh, models be used in, in basic care in lots of places. As one example, you know, we've been doing work in uh, a Google research and our Google health organization in um, a problem called diabetic retinopathy, which is a disease of the eye and really, it's as it's a side effect of people who are at risk for diabetes. And there's about 400 million people around the world that should be screened every year for this. And in many places in the world, especially in places like India or Thailand, there aren't enough um, uh, ophthalmologists to actually look at these retinal images and diagnose this in time. And so people, even though this disease is very treatable, it's something where people usually often suffer kind of full or partial vision loss before they're diagnosed because of this lack of, of doctors to do the screening. And so we've actually been working with uh, a couple of networks of Indian eye hospitals and are now also working in, in a deployment in a couple of uh, uh, districts in Thailand to deploy this machine learning model that we've trained that is now not just the quality of a ophthalmologist, but the quality of a retinal specialist, which is someone who has many more years of advanced training in this, and to actually use that model to do screening of patients. And this is something that I think is a great example where 
if we take this and deploy it in all places in the world that it should be deployed, you know, all of a sudden we'll have much better health, healthcare outcomes through machine learning. And I think things like educational tutoring and things like uh, you know climate and weather prediction and flood forecasting are all examples where machine learning is really going to benefit people all over the world uh, and maybe even disproportionately in, in developing markets. So I, I'm pretty excited in, about all the opportunities in the world. Amazing. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Zhang, for, for joining us. And uh, I would like to move to another question. It's anonymous, but it's also kind of related to to our topic at the moment, which is, uh, do you think Google should open an engineering office in Vietnam, given our large pool of talented and hardworking developers? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Google has quite a number of offices all around the world, and we were constantly evaluating, you know, should we open more of them, and if so, where? And I think, you know, as the questioner asks, uh, or, or states, because of Vietnam's, you know, strong background in, you know, math and science, you have a number of like, uh, up, you, you know, relatively young engineering student population, and I think that's a, a hallmark of some place where we might consider in the future opening an office. Um, you have good weather, uh, people like to live there. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's definitely a place where we might consider it. I, we don't have any plans at the moment, but I, I, I do think it would be on the list of, of places we're going to look at. Amazing. I really hope that it's going to come. That would be great. Yeah. That would be great. <laughs> I, would, I will say one thing about the current kind of COVID situation is I think, you know, we as a company, as many other people all around the world, the organizations have really had to get much better at um you know not all being in the same building you know it, it's really you know people are working from all kinds of different situations today and you know some aspects of that are not nearly as good as being in person but i think we've all kind of realized that um it actually works reasonably well in a lot of cases right like we can have events like this where you and i are in california in you know, vietnam and you know, it's not quite the same as being there, but it actually is pretty effective. And within our research organization, we have offices all around the world. I think research is especially good at being able to be done in lots of different offices because it's not the kind of thing where you have a really tight deadline engineering process where you're by February 17th, you need to do this so that then the, the next team by February 20th can do this. But it's really a bit more about, you know, many different sort of research efforts going on in communicating somewhat but not quite at the level of like this has to be done this has to be done mm -hmm. and so that does tend to make it more amenable to being distributed in lots of different places perfect thank you that, that's great Jeff. Um, so i would say that uh, if you could actually you know have a stronger case for uh the the, the strength of the talent in vietnam then um, Two of uh, members of our AI residency program actually uh, had paper accepted at ICML this year. So um, they're doing very well. Very nice. Great. Yeah, thank you, Vinaya, for helping put Vietnam onto the uh, world research map. Thank you. Um, great. So, so far, we've talked a lot about how we can help push the technical front of AI in Vietnam. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit and uh, let's talk a little bit more about the societal aspects of AI. Um, and the first topic that I, I think could benefit from more attention in Vietnam is in uh, gender diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, so, Jeff, I know that you're a big advocate of gender diversity. Uh, in fact, I met you at Grace Hopper Conference last year when you took a few days off from work to to go talk to to women in the world's largest gathering of women in computing. Right? So I was really inspired and encouraged by that. So thank you for that. Um, however, not a lot of tech leaders think like you, and I want to bring your attention to this particular uh, article published on a pretty big newspaper in Vietnam uh, by uh, a pretty good machine learning practitioner. Her name is Chip Quinn. Mm -hmm. and, and she said that uh, a CTO of a pretty big uh, tech company in Vietnam said that he wouldn't hire women 
because women are not as technically as talented as men or not as persistent under pressure as men. So I know that these are very contentious points of debate. So, but regardless of whether these statistics are true, uh, I think it's still dangerous to reduce a person to just the mean or the mode of their gender population, or in other words, to use uh, stereotypes in these hiring decisions. Uh, but sadly, a lot of the people in the comments of the articles actually agree with these stereotypes and approve of the decision of the CTO. Uh, so I want to ask you, Jeff, uh, why do you take a different stand and why do you advocate uh, for women in computing? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the field of computing is something that is incredibly transformative for so many things in the world. Yeah. And you really want everyone affected by these technologies to be involved in the process of creating these technologies. And I think, uh, it, you know, I have a, uh, two daughters and my older daughter is a PhD student studying computer science, uh, machine learning and robotics. And, um, you know, I want her to have a environment where she's welcomed, she's, you know, accepted, her research ideas are, you know, looked at no, no differently than anyone else's research ideas. Uh, certainly not because of her gender. Um, and I think one of the things that helped shape my childhood was that I, I moved around a lot of the trials. I went to 11 schools in 12 years, and I lived for a year in Uganda and six months in Somalia and many different places in the United States, including Hawaii and Boston and Arkansas, which are all very different kinds of places. And I think one of the things I found was that you... Uh, you know, you, you, the, no one place or no one kind of people are better than any other. Everyone has things to contribute to the world and to, you know, uh, different, different fields of endeavor. And if you're dismissing half the people in the world because of prejudice, you are basically selling yourself short because there's incredibly talented people all over the world of all different, you know, countries of origin, you know, uh, different genders, different, you know, length, ability to speak different languages. All of these things are really, really important that we want the people all over the world to be working on the most important and, and, and societally impactful problems. Um, and that's, that's why I feel it's really important for all of us in the field to be welcoming and to bring people in with different perspectives, different kinds of backgrounds. I will say one of the things that I've found throughout my career is when I work on research projects, you know, I, I often try to find ones where I have some of the skills for this kind of problem, but where I don't have all the skills and where you can bring together a team of people who have different kinds of skills and expertise and perspectives on the problem. And they everyone contributes and no one of you could do this project individually because you don't have the full set of, of skills that are needed. Uh, and so I think that's why you really need everyone's perspective and uh, you know you want more women studying computer science because it makes the field better. Yeah. Thank you. I do agree with that and it's not just diversity in genders, right? It's diversity in the other ways too. And I really hope that we could see that in Vietnam too. Um, and then another concern from our participants is AI threats to job security. I uh, hear a few questions that uh, I collected from the participants uh, from Vietnam. And it seems that they have concerns all across the board, uh, whether AI will be uh, threatening to people with high qualifications or with for low skills workers. Uh, would it um, Kind of create a gap uh, between the rich and the poor in society and so in a in the interest of time maybe we can uh, address all these questions by by asking um do you think if ai is gonna be a problem to will be a threat to our jobs and maybe actually can ai create more jobs for society yeah uh so i mean i definitely uh have talked with lots of people around the world who are you know resonating with these kinds of questions and i think um, the way to view this is AI and machine learning is, a, is an advanced technology and that it can be applied to lots of problems and make it so that we can solve some kinds of problems more efficiently uh, and sometimes with better outcomes. Often AI and machine learning 
are tools that are put into the hands of people and enable them to solve more interesting problems or uh, problems with kind of where the computer or the machine learning model does the part that is kind of repetitive and actually not as interesting a, a, an intellectual task as some of the things that uh, humans are you know, really good at. Um, and so I think of it as a, a partnership where we're trying to build things that make us all more effective and able to do more. Um, now, I will say there's definitely going to be shifts in what people do because sudden, suddenly some parts of what people do in a job may be able to be automated and that will kind of shift what someone who's doing that job, you know, maybe 70% of what they do now can be done more effectively with a machine learning model, but the 30% that they do still needs to be done. And also their job will expand to include other things that now are possible that they didn't have time or the ability to do before. Um, I do think societies and governments need to be thinking carefully about how jobs are gonna shift. So for example, autonomous vehicles, you, you mentioned autonomous vehicles in Hanoi are gonna be very challenging. So maybe that's not where they will come first, but autonomous vehicles will eventually be rolled out. And there's a tremendous number of jobs in the world that are related to driving, bus drivers, taxi drivers, and, and delivery vehicles, and so on. But I think that's gonna shift what we do as a society, right? It's gonna shift that. And I think as long as governments and you know, uh, societal fabric makes sure that people who were previously in, engaged in driving jobs uh, have opportunities to develop different skills that are now much more in demand, that everything will be will be fine. You know, we jobs have shifted for a long time. We didn't previously have airplane pilots. We had people who you know uh, worked on trains. Now we have people who work on airplanes, and people move around by airplanes. And that hasn't sort of been completely disruptive. It's just been a ability for us to do more as a society. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, society can still uh, adapt as technology advances. Um, and then, if, if I could, I could just you know go back to your previous question on uh, gender, um, uh, and 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 I, I think it's really great that you know for people like you to you know become a good model for future generations, and um, I. Uh, you know, like, so we have about, I don't know, maybe 10% of our AI residency program um, are females. And uh, you know, we, we, we treat them like pieces of stones, you know, like, uh, but, you know, it, it's really hard to find them. And um, and I think, uh, you know, I think as you know pretty well that um, 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 the, 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 the new generation um, uh, girls in Vietnam, I think they, they need uh, role models like you. Um, and I think that's really important. So I think it's really great that, you know, you guys are doing uh, something like this uh, in BCK, Bon Chum Kong, you know, you know, so that's really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and I really hope that I could, could help inspire some people. <laughs> it's not just me. Uh, thank you again. Um, and then uh, I want to switch to yet another topic, I think um, is also could benefit from a little bit more attention in AI in Vietnam, which is ethics. And this includes fairness, privacy, security, accessibility, et cetera. Um, and so here are a few questions uh, from our participants. What are the ethical criteria upheld by Google in building AI systems? And uh, what does Vietnam need to do to prepare for the vision of AI development with these ethical concerns in mind? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, AI and machine learning are really core technologies that are not in and of themselves like great or negative, right? The, the things that make whether they are, are ethical are how you think about applying these technologies to different problems in the world. And, you know, we've been thinking about this for quite some time as we tried to, as we have put machine learning and AI in more and more of our products and in features that we develop for our products. Um, and I think one of the things that has helped us as a company, uh, you know, about four or five years ago, we started to look at these kinds of problems and try to say, 
well, we could do this this way or this way. This way seems like it would be better in a lot of ways because maybe you would, you know, uh, be less biased or would treat everyone around the world in, in giving them similar outcomes from this model. Uh, and as we got a little bit more formalized about that, we came up with a set of principles by which we look at any given use, potential use of AI and machine learning in our products uh, and sort of look at them in, in, uh, with respect to these principles. So these are things like, uh, you know, how does this AI and machine learning model affect uh, privacy or uh, human rights or uh, is, does it have particular kinds of bias that seem unfair and undesirable? Um, is it sort of something that is augmenting humans and giving them the ability to do more positive things in the world or not? And so we have seven principles. If you go search for Google AI principles, you can see the list. But I think this, this sort of more formal framing of a, a set of ethical principles by which we look at different problems has really helped us as a company. And now we have a, a fairly comprehensive review process by which you know, every machine learning related uh, launch or, you know, development within our, our organization goes through this AI principles review process. We sort of look at it and we say, no, no, we really shouldn't do this. Or, you know, this seems okay, but maybe we should test if the model is biased in certain ways. And if it is, then remedy that. Um, and I think uh, two years ago, we published those principles uh, in public so that other organizations or people or, or, or companies thinking about these issues could, could benefit from our, our own thinking about, you know, what are the ways in which we want to make sure that uh, our AI sort of uh, uses of AI are consistent with our ethical principles. And I think that, that's been very, very helpful. It's also gotten all of our engineers and, and machine learning uh, researchers thinking about these issues in, in, in a similar way, and that, is, that has been helpful. Great. Um, I'm, I'm sure uh, that people in Vietnam would be able to look up these principles, uh, and then hopefully we can take that into our development process and think about it uh, when we do AI in Vietnam. And um, lastly, to uh, end this conversation, I want to switch to a little bit of uh, the questions about personal or career development uh, for Jeff. So uh, we have a lot of questions like this. Um, one of them is, I'm a big fan of your work. Your map reduce and TensorFlow papers were inspirations for me to pursue AI and big data. So that's very similar to me. Uh, I have two questions. What are your secrets to keep producing influential research and engineering works throughout your career? Uh, what are the key habits to become a great computer scientist leader that you practice? And similarly, we have someone ask, what are some lessons learned uh, you learned from your time designing and building software systems at Google Scale? Sure, uh, I, I appreciate the question. I, 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 um, uh, I mean, I think, there are a lot of different things that I've done throughout my career that I think are useful. So one is, um, you know, I feel like I'm fairly willing to dive into new problems where I don't know or have the skills, all, all of the skills needed to tackle the problem and where I can work with other people sort of uh, who have different sort of complementary skills to my own. So, um, you know, I don't have like a super strong mathematical background for doing mathematical proofs or things like that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I work with people who do have that kind of uh, more of a mathematical mindset in, in tackling problems. And together, you know, we often can tackle problems that neither one of us could tackle individually. Um, and I find that one, one of the things that happens when you do that is some amount of your expertise kind of rubs off on them as you're working together on solving the problem and some of their expertise kind of rubs off on you. And now you at least know kind of the right kinds of questions to ask about this other field that you didn't previously know very much about. And then maybe you part ways and go off and work on separate problems and then you do this again with some other people. And I think this is a really good way to continue learning throughout your career and to keep kind of building the set of skills that you have um, and, and uh, then as you're you're effectively trying to build this this really big toolkit uh, around your belt 
And as you do more and more problems, you know, your toolkit gets bigger and you can kind of look at more problems and pull little bits of this and that from previous problems you've worked on and identify connections and say, okay, well, you know, this new problem, I know how to solve a lot of it. You know, these five things will be really useful and I can kind of see how they would be put together. Uh, but then this other part, I don't quite know enough about, or I don't quite see how to solve that. And so that's going to be the really hard part about the new problem. Um, so I think those are the kinds of things that that have been really helpful in my career. Um, you know, another piece of advice I give to students is because you want this this set of connections from lots of different areas uh, to be in the back of your mind as you're focusing on a new problem, it's often better to skim 10 papers to read one, right? Because what you want is the rough idea of how these 10 different things that are pretty unrelated can be done, not necessarily all the details, because you can always go look at the details once you recognize that these three things are gonna be really useful for tackling this new problem. Um, and it might even be better to, to, to read 100 abstracts than to skim 10 papers, because you want this constellation of different ideas and approaches to solving problems that you can then bring to bear to solve any new problem. Yeah, thank you for that advice. I think it's really useful, uh, especially for me, at least. Oh, oh, can I add on to that just a tiny bit? I mean, one of the things that I've also really benefited from is working with really great colleagues, you know, the kinds of people that you uh, are ambitious that you want to work together to solve some hard problem and are also kind of fun to work with. I think one of the really most important things that you can do is to make sure that when you're working on solving problems that you're also enjoying that. And one of the ways to do that is to surround yourself with people who you like working hard with, but also, you know, taking a break at the coffee machine and chatting about weather or whatever. Um, and, you know, I've been very fortunate in my career to have many, many great colleagues. Uh, one of the most close colleagues I have is my colleague Sanjay Gemawat, who I've worked with now for 24 years, even before I, we both joined Google. Um, and, you know, we, we work together on lots of different problems. We've probably, you know, made 10,000 individual decisions together uh, pair programming at the same keyboard. Um, you know, he, he types, I put my feet up on the desk uh, and we work together writing code, you know, debugging things, designing new systems and finding uh, someone that you can work really well together is a really, I think, important aspect of how do you, you know, enjoy work and make progress on lots of problems. Thank you. I can attest that I have a very good experience working at uh, DeepMind Alphabet in general. And I'm sure that the uh, experience in BINAI is also the same. That was some great advice, Jeff. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, so could we go to and go through quickly the rest of the Q&A? We have a lot of great questions. So uh, yeah, we would just quickly go through, uh, through some of the very interesting questions from the Q&A. Uh, and I guess we already answered. So uh, what would you work on if you were just starting your career in AI today? Uh, well, I would probably first take an, a machine learning class. Unfortunately, when I was going through university, the, there weren't really uh, a lot of machine learning classes. I didn't take any. Um, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm generally most excited about the kinds of things where you're working on fundamental research, but then also seeing it through and applying it to really important problems. And so I think, you know, the, the opportunities in, in healthcare and in using machine learning to improve our understanding and ability to, to improve uh, climate science are going to be like really transformative in the world. And I think those kinds of things are very motivating for me personally. So. Yeah. Perfect. Um, we're about to be out of time. Uh, so do you want to go through like all these questions question quickly or should we end this early? Uh, I don't know. What, how do you, however you want to do it. Okay. Um, I don't think we have a lot of these opportunities. So I'm sorry that we're going to have to go over time a little bit, but I'll try to, let's try to go through these questions quickly. Perfect. We don't yeah. have a lot of opportunities like this. 
Okay, so uh, fire question. Which machine learning applications are you personally most excited about? Uh, that's the one we just did, I think. Isn't that the one we just did? Uh, uh, no, we just did another one. Um, oh, really? That was the one I answered. <laughs> It's all good. Okay, so beside AI, what are some other technological trends uh, that are most interesting to you? Um, I mean, I guess uh, obviously the uh, development in genetics and genomic information seems pretty interesting. That's been, you know, a field of tremendous advances in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, I think like our ability to create uh, reusable space uh, vehicles is going to be pretty interesting. And more, more recently, I've gotten interested in uh, urban planning. So I've been reading a bunch of books about how to design cities to make them more livable and more effective for the people who live there. You know, how can you make it so people like more places and don't drive and these kinds of things. There, there's a lot of interesting things there. Okay, perfect. Next fire question. What motivate you to work every day? Um, I mean, I think... I got into computer science because I felt like it was a really great uh, discipline where you can tackle really important problems and where a relatively small number of people can have really uh, a lot of impact on the world because software has this amazing quality that you can solve a problem and then all of a sudden millions or now billions of people can benefit from the, the solution to that problem that you've created because you can replicate it for no cost, basically. And I think that's what motivates me is how can we find, how can I find new and interesting problems that I think will, will sort of improve people's lives in some way. And sometimes that's, you know, how can I make it easier for software developers to do something that they couldn't do before? Sometimes that's more product oriented things where maybe we can improve the quality of translations or search results and and you know, affect a billion people tomorrow. That, that's what's exciting. Amazing. Uh, next quick one, what's your favorite dad joke? I'm very curious about this one. Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, what are the spot? I do like dad jokes. If you search my Twitter feed, I tend to try to make uh, some uh, dad jokes there. <laughs> okay, we'll do that. And then last one, uh, how can you surpass the feeling uh, of struggle when you're learning something, uh, some new piece of technology, which is a novel knowledge? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the things that is really important when you're diving into a new area is to make sure that you have kind of the right material that is at the level that is good for you to, to pick it up quickly. Um, actually, I... You know, I mentioned that often you want to bring together people who know different things than you do and work together on a problem. I, I find this is actually really effective at teaching you new material because the people you work with often are you know, have a lot of expertise in that other area and you know almost nothing. But they can sort of assess um, at what level you are in learning about this new thing. And they can give you you know, exactly the right level of information. It's almost like having, you're working together, but they're also your private tutor in, you know, statistics or, you know, computer vision or whatever it is that they know that you don't. And they can say, oh yeah, convolutions are super important. You should go read this paper. And you're like, oh great, I don't know what those are, but I'm gonna go read that paper. And then you come back the next day and you're like, okay, I read that paper, that seems pretty cool. And then you have a bunch more questions. And then they can, sort of in a very directed way, give you just the right next step. So I think we all know that personalized tutoring is really effective in sort of earlier education, but it's also true in sort of more specialized fields and more advanced research topics where getting someone who knows what you know, knows what you don't know, and can give you the right kind of next spoonful of, of goodness uh, is a really good way to learn things. Okay. Great. Thank you for your answers. These are all really interesting, but I'm sorry that we're going to have to to cut now. Um, this has been a very interesting conversation. And uh, Jeff, I really hope that one day we can welcome you in person in Vietnam and then people in Vietnam could pro probably interact and ask more of these questions to you.
Do you have any uh, parting thoughts or anything you would like to say to uh, the audience before we say goodbye? Um, first, I want to say thank you very much for, for the great questions and for, for moderating this uh, and for having me. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to people in, in Vietnam and elsewhere. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't come in person this, this summer as I was planning to do due to COVID, but I will get to Vietnam at some point. And uh, Hung, thank you for also participating. And Envy, thank you so much. Thank you. And who do you, do you have anything else to say? Uh, I just want to say, you know, thanks a lot again for you know making this happen, and uh, that was really fat fantastic to have a chance to just chat with Jeff. Amazing! Thank you both for being here, and goodbye. Great. So our chat with Jeff Dean has come to an end. Uh, I want to note that this discussion is for the interest of students, engineers in Vietnam about AI, and none of this discussion could be quoted or repurposed for any other purpose. Um, there will be more discussion with other amazing speakers to come today, actually. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about AI in Vietnam, please feel free to check out AI Day 2020, uh, organized by uh, Bin AI Research. And the link to this event will be displayed at the end of this live stream and also in the description box below. Thank you again for joining us and goodbye.